For those who don't know me, my name is Betsy Kielkowski, and um, I am part of the Earth Care Committee for uh, Ithaca Monthly Meeting of Friends or Quakers, and we are welcoming you to a presentation on heat pumps. We've invited two energy navigators from Tompkins County, Cornell Cooperative Extension to explain and help answer your questions. Anne Rhodes and Lee Miller both work on the environmental team at Cooperative Extension. Lee is a community energy advisor and Anne works in energy education and outreach. We are very lucky to have both of them. We appreciate it uh, and live in this area because both New York State with its Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and Ithaca with its Green New Deal are legislating towards climate neutrality. They are taking the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change it's warning seriously to keep a global rise in temperature under 1.5 Celsius, which is 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. We have been warned that rising above this will bring unlivable conditions around the world. That's pretty scary. Heat pumps are part of this proposed solution. But for many of us, who are interested in heat pumps, this raises a lot of questions. What are the pros and cons of heat pumps? Are they good fit for my house? Should I get them now or wait till later and they get better? These are serious questions with serious consequences. Our Earth Care Committee is trying to take the Quaker concept of unity with nature and walk it into our lives and our worship. Before we start the presentation, if you don't mind, I would like to take a Quaker practice of using a moment of silence to settle into the consideration that this is not just about heat pumps that we're talking. It is about how to live in ways that makes Earth a better place for all creatures. So we just have a moment of silence. Now, Margaret, uh, another Quaker, uh, before we turn this over to um, Anne and Lee will explain how you ask questions and what's the best way to organize this tech, uh, technologically. So Margaret, it's okay. up to you to take it from here. Yeah, so um, we're gonna have all the questions, um, the question and answer period after Anne and Lee have given their presentation uh, a lot of the questions that come up for you, they may answer in the course of the presentation. But what you can do is as a question occurs to you during the presentation, you can write it in the chat and I'll be monitoring it as it goes. And then Ann and Lee will look at it when they're through. Uh, if you can't easily type into chat, then just write it down on your own and then ask it during the Q&A. And um, if you're on a computer where you can easily raise your digital hand or raise your physical hand, I'll be monitoring for physical hands. Uh, we'll look for people with questions that way. Um, if you're on a phone, um, you can use star nine to raise your hand and then we'll know you have a question. Um, and then star six, you can unmute to speak. Um, and um, so, if you're on a phone or a tablet and we're really, really not noticing you, if worse comes to worse, just speak up when we're between questions. Um, we Because we really want to be able to hear what your questions are, but we do ask that you wait until um, Lee and Anne are through with their presentations. So, Betsy, I'm gonna let you- Take it away. <laughs> Great, thank you. I want to um, 
Thank you for inviting us. We're glad to be here with you uh, to share all about heat pumps. We're going to share some information um, and we're going to try to address your um, questions and your concerns. So the first question is why heat pumps? And as Betsy pointed out, um, 2023 was the warmest year on record. And both locally and globally, we can see the effects of the climate crisis. There's plenty of evidence. Um, and the main way to mitigate or address um, the climate crisis is to stop using fossil fuels. By fossil fuels, we mean uh, coal, propane, oil, and fossil gas, which the industry calls natural gas. Um, and in terms of reducing fossil fuel use, our buildings account for 40% of greenhouse gas emissions in this country. So addressing um, the ways that buildings use heat, heat and cool their cool themselves um, is going to be critical because it it takes up 40, it produces 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to get all buildings off of fossil gas and onto electricity. And although our grid isn't perfect, it's pretty clean upstate here and it's getting cleaner um, using hydro and solar and wind. And there is some nuclear uh, as well as using gas to produce electricity. But electricity will get cleaner over time. But gas, natural gas and oil and propane will not get cleaner over time. <laughs> so there's also, as Betsy mentioned, the state law, the CLCPA, which is going to require us moving away from fossil fuels. So that said, what's the solution? Well, the solution is to switch to electric heating, uh, home heating and water heating um, and cooling and clothes dryers switch to electric off of any kind of fossil fuels. So we will heat and cool our homes and heat our water with heat pumps. So that's, that's my cue here. And just wanna make sure, are you all seeing the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Full screen and everything? Yes. All right, wonderful. I'm happy to be here with you all. Uh, I'm Lee, I use she, her pronouns, and uh, gonna take it away from Anne uh, for a minute. So Anne led the great um, entry point into why we're thinking about heat pumps, which many of you probably already have in mind since you're here at the presentation. And so now we'll just talk a little bit about what heat pumps are. Um, you may have heard uh, differing amounts about them. So this is an example of one type of heat pump, an air source heat pump, which is, um, on part of the unit is on the outside of the house, and there's also part of a heat pump inside the house. And what a heat pump is, is uh, it moves heat from the outside air or from the ground into your home. Even on a really cold day, it can um, extract heat from the um, particles in the outside air uh, using a refrigerant and compressing it uh, and move that heat inside the house. And in the summer, a heat pump can function in a reverse mode and throw that heat from your house um, outside of it and cycle nice cool air inside. Uh, and heat pumps are actually a similar to technology you already have in your house, which is a refrigerator. Um, a refrigerator takes the heat from inside that space where your food is and moves it out of the uh, out of the refrigerator. So. This uh, diagram shows a bit about a heat pump and the way the cycle works, but um, in general, they're a very efficient form of electric heat and they're more efficient than electric resistance heat since they're moving heat that already exists instead of creating something from scratch. Um, there are all, it's also an option to pair water heating with heat pumps. So some systems can have water heating built into them or you can have a standalone heat pump water heater system. And I mentioned that there are two types of heat pumps. So air source and ground source are the two types. You may have heard uh, one form of an air source heat pump is called a mini split. Um, that's an example of the head shown on the left. That's the unit on the wall and 
um, that's an air source heat pump without ducts. It's called a ductless mini split and they pop the head onto your wall and there's an outdoor unit um, like the picture we saw a few slides ago. And then there's also ducted air source heat pumps, which um, plugs right into your existing ductwork if you have that. And then the picture on the right shows geothermal and ground, which is also called ground source heat pumps. Um, and that takes the air, the heat from the ground and transfers, transfers it into your house. And so when you're thinking about air and ground source heat pumps, um, a ground source heat pump is a more expensive upfront investment since they have to dig trenches in your yard or drill deep down, but it does function more efficiently over time since it's taking heat from uh, a steady state temperature of about 55 degrees in the earth moving into your house versus an air source heat pump has to work a little harder to extract heat from a cold winter day outside, but it's very doable. So in summary, the air source heat pump is a bit more of an affordable upfront option. And if you don't have land that works for geothermal, that's another reason you might consider air source. Um, and geothermal is a more expensive upfront cost, but better payoff over time. In any case, both of them are very efficient forms of electric heat. Um, and with your system, you can get cooling from it as well. Uh, certain types of systems have the cooling already built in, others you can add in with it. So um, that's a bit of a briefing on uh, heat pumps. And then we'll let Anne jump in with a step you'll want to take before installing heat pumps in your home. Really important before you buy heat pumps to think about ways your home might be wasting heat. Because if you don't write, if you don't take care of insulating and air sealing ahead of time, you will end up buying a heat pump system that's oversized and more expensive than you need. So you need to make sure that your home is not wasting heat before you decide on what size heat pump system you're gonna buy. So there are two ways that the house loses heat in the winter. One is uh, through conduction. And that is you may not have enough insulation in your walls and in your ceiling, in your attic. Conduction lets heat move out through a solid surface. And if you don't have good insulation, your house is losing heat constantly through the walls and through the attic. The other way of losing heat is through the holes and cracks that are in your basement and in your attic little places wires go through or pipes go through that weren't caulked appropriately and heat can escape that way. If you don't seal the cracks, it's the equivalent of leaving a window, like you can see on the left, open all winter. That's how much heat you're losing. So it's really important to take care of insulation and air sealing before you think about what kind of heat pump system you wanna buy. So the way to do that is to get an energy audit. And luckily, they're free from New York State. You can have a certified contractor come to your home and check for air leaks and check your insulation levels. They'll also check appliances and they'll check for health and safety. This is money that comes out of a small charge that's on your NYSEG bill, or um, which goes into a pool of money and that's paying for the energy audits. They're completely free, they're easy to apply for. A contractor will come into your home and um, assess with, where you're losing heat and how much heat you're losing. So you can go, go to the great. So if your attic is poorly insulated, you'll see icicles. Icicles are a sign that heat is escaping from your attic, it's not properly insulated. It's warming up underneath the snow and melting it and causing icicles. So if you see icicles on your home, you know that your attic does not have good enough insulation. And on the left-hand side, you can see in the back of that house and the back peak, there's a little dark spot where there's no snow. That means that heat is escaping right through the roof. Oh. and melting the snow on top of the roof. So when the, um, when the contractor comes in to do the audit, 
they have a couple of tools that are going to help them figure out what your house needs. One is a thermal imaging. It's a it's an infrared camera that can point at the walls and at the ceiling and in the attic and in the foundation and show you where heat is getting out, where you're losing heat. So they're often pockets. You may have insulated a wall, but it, if it's cellulose, maybe it's settled. And so there's a place at the top where there's not enough insulation. Um, the second, so that's about insulation. This is about um, air sealing, cracks and holes where air is escaping. And what happens, you can see in the diagram on the left, the red arrows are going up. That shows the places that heat is getting out of your house. When heat goes out through the top, through the little holes and cracks in the roof and um, in the upper windows, what that does, heat rises, right? Remember that from elementary school. Um, it creates a vacuum in the home. And the vacuum draws cold air in from the basement. Wherever their heat is coming, heat is going up, it's drawing cold air in from the basement. And you can see the blue arrows at the bottom of that diagram, basement windows, places where pipes are going out, little holes and cracks, cold air is sneaking in. So that cold air comes up into your living space and you heat it up so you're comfortable. And as soon as it gets hot, it rises and then it goes out the top. And that creates a vacuum and that draws more cold air in from the bottom. And then you heat that air up and then that air gets hot and it rises up and it goes out the top and you draw more air. So it becomes just, just this cycle of fresh air coming into your, and you're spending money to heat new air all the time. Meanwhile, you're warming up your backyard. So it's really important to seal all the cracks and holes so that this stack effect doesn't happen. And one of the ways that the auditor will find out where you have leaks is this thing you see on the right, which is called a blower door. And they attach it to an, an exterior door and they create a negative pressure in the house. And then they walk around the house and they can find the places where air is streaming in because they're creating this negative pressure through the blower door. So they get a number of how badly your house is leaking and they get a sense of where those leaks are coming in and then they can be addressed. When the auditor is finished with the infrared work and the blower door and the other things that they're doing, they will write a report for you and they will list all the things that you could do to keep your house from losing heat, from wasting heat. And so you'll get a full report. You'll get a sense of how, th how much things will cost what are highest priorities? And then you can choose. You may not want to do all of it right away. You may not be able to afford to do all of it way. You can take your time. You don't have to use that contractor. You can use a different contractor. You can get a second quote from a different contractor. You can look at which kinds of changes that you decide to make might have the quickest payback and save the most energy. So you choose. And we have people available, such as Lee, um, to help you make those decisions, to look at your report with you and figure out what makes the most sense for you. And then you're ready to decide on a contractor and to, to get the work done before you buy a heat pump system. I think that does it for, yeah. Yeah. Good. So now that Ann and I have talked a bit about heat pumps and then the step you want to take before that, which is getting an energy assessment and weatherizing your house, I'm going to jump into um, a brief overview of some of the incentives available. As you all might have heard, there are a lot of different funding sources to help fund both energy efficiency improvements, so insulating and air sealing your house, as well as to fund heat pumps. And this slide has a lot of information on it, but don't worry, I, I won't go word for word through it. And um, you also will have access to these slides. We'll be sharing them with Betsy and Margaret after the meeting. And so um, they'll be sharing them out with you. Or if you're not on Betsy and Margaret's um, Earth Care email list, you can get in touch with them or with me for the slides. So the point I'd just like to make uh, on this slide is just letting you know that there are a variety of different incentives for insulating your home. 
And these incentives differ based on your income. There are significant incentives if you're lower income that um, where you can get a lot of work done for free in your house. And then even the folks with higher income can benefit from tax credits um, for insulating their house. So there's lots of different incentives. They come from the federal government, from the state. Uh, there's also some local programs. So lots of different programs. They can go toward, toward homeowners and um, many can also apply to renters. So uh, again, you'll have access to review these slides later, but just wanted to touch on the fact that there's a variety of different programs. Uh, and this first program on the slide, Empower Plus, um, that's a pretty significant grant available through the state, um, which can offer up to $10,000 toward qualifying energy improvements. And uh, just to give you a sense and, and kind of pique your interest of um, whether that grant might apply to you. This is an example of the income limits for Tompkins County. The limits differ per county, but um, you can see in this chart that folks in the column on the right are available or are eligible for a matching grant of up to $5,000. So half of the cost of work done to their house up to $5,000. Whereas folks on the left have a grant of up to $10,000, um, which could cover all of the work or a majority of it. So um, this is just a, one example of one of the many programs that are out there to help you make these changes. And uh, if you see yourself fitting into these income limits here, that's a, an especially great reason to get in touch with a community energy advisor like me, because we can help you navigate um, pairing together uh, all of these incentives. And then when it comes to heat pumps, the programs I just showed were for weatherizing your house, but there is some overlap. The Empower Plus program, which is that grant program with the income limits on the other page, um, that is a program that has a free energy assessment and weatherization funds. And then if your home gets up to a certain weatherization standard, you can use that funding to go toward your heat pumps as well. Um, so that state grant is a great resource. There's also rebates that are available for air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, and heat pump water heaters um, through the New York State Clean Heat Program. And then there are tax credits that uh, folks who have a tax burden can take advantage of. And then I made a couple notes on the uh, right side of the screen there, just noting there are some local grants. Uh, folks who live in Lansing and in nearby areas around Lansing on natural gas have a special incentive to switch to heat pumps. And then we're lucky to have Sustainable Finger Lakes, a local organization who is currently running two different types of pilots. One is to put heat pumps in rentals in the city and town of Ithaca, and the other is for homeowners in mobile homes to install heat pumps. So as you can see, there's a variety, a variety of different incentives. And uh, that's why a community energy advisor is a great resource because we can help you navigate which you are eligible for and help you pair them together. And just a little note about the Inflation Reduction Act. That was a federal act passed a couple of years ago. And as part of that, there are um, rebates coming for making your house more energy efficient, which can be insulation and a variety of other measures, as well as rebates for electrifying your home. And that goes toward heat pumps um, and uh, a few other different technologies as well. And these Inflation Reduction Act rebates uh, are expected to come down the pipe in part later this spring, maybe in a few months or so. And then the full rebate should be available in late 2024. And this is based on what we're hearing from NYSERDA. So, um, you know, can't promise you the exact date, but just wanted to let you know what we've heard so far and to know that there's great incentives now and there are a few more uh, coming down the pipe later this year. So now you uh, are, have been briefed on all these different incentives available for heat pumps and just to kind of summarize some of the main advantages of heat pumps. Um, they're very energy efficient, so they're 200 to 400 percent efficient, meaning that they can produce um, a, a good amount of heat from the electricity that they use. As you mentioned, they provide heating and can also provide cooling. And some of us might feel pretty hot in the summer and feel like a, a really efficient form of air conditioning is a great way to, to stay cool and um, 
and to be prepared for climate changes in the future. Heat pumps also have the benefit of dehumidifying your house, uh, especially air source heat pumps take, um, if you put the heat pump technology in an area of your home that is humid, um, they can uh, cycle in some of that humidity and put dry air um, out. So they have, there's other side benefits of heat pumps, particularly heat pump water heaters can be very useful for dehumidifying um, a utility room, for example. And hot water heating can be part of a heat pump system. You can have a standalone heat pump water heater or um, some heat pump systems can also incorporate water heating in them. Your indoor air quality is also uh, benefiting from heat pumps. You're not burning combust, you're not um, having combustion in your home and it's a very clean and um, healthy way to heat your home. Additionally, there's great energy savings in terms of your heating bill each month. If you're currently heating with propane or oil or electric resistance heating, you'll see um, significant financial savings each month when you switch to a heat pump. If you're currently heating with natural gas, that's when the equation is gets a little closer because um, gas prices are pretty good right now and gas and electric prices are, um, they fluctuate at the whims of, of NYSEG and um, they do tend to change. So right now, natural gas to heat pumps isn't an especially enticing financial equation, but any of these other um, fuels, you'll see significant savings. And um, with natural gas, as you can see, there's many other types of benefits that go along with heat pumps. So that's just a little insight into some of the finances there. They're also a very convenient form of heating and uh, you can control it with a remote or a thermostat. And there's also very little maintenance. Um, these uh, heat pumps, like any heating system, they do need service and checks, but they, they tend to run pretty well and have uh, a good lifespan. A very exciting part of heat pumps is, Anne touched on the grid and how if we electrify our heating system, as the electric grid gets cleaner, our, um, our energy use in our home gets cleaner and cleaner over time. One way that we can expedite that is once you have electrified your home, meaning that you heat with these electric heat pumps as opposed to um, a natural gas or propane furnace, you can power those heat pumps with solar power. And that um, is a very green way to, uh, to keep your house going. And with solar, you might think that you don't have a good property for solar, so you can't fit it on your roof or your yard. But I just wanted to touch briefly here that there's a few different types of solar. You can put it on your own property or on your roof, and there are incentives for that. You can also purchase solar panels at an offsite solar farm. And then lastly, a pretty low lift option is to subscribe to a local solar farm for a portion of your monthly electric bill, and you get a 5 to 10% discount per month on your electric payments and part of your money is supporting solar development. So as an energy advisor, I'm happy to talk with anyone about these solar options uh, as well and want to focus on heat pumps today, but just put that plug in that um, down the line, solar uh, is another way to um, get those heat pumps to be most efficient and to get your home the greenest that you can. And um, just to, before I pass it on to Anne, just to kind of summarize the what we've talked about so far, the first step for your house is doing the energy assessment and insulating and weatherizing it to reduce the amount of energy you're using. And even if you're not switching to heat pumps, that's a great step to take because if you're, um, you know, burning natural gas in your home and then you insulate it, you'll need ne less natural gas and you'll save money each month and you'll also be uh, making a good impact on the environment. So anyone, even if they're not thinking about heat pumps, can get a lot of benefits from a free energy assessment and weatherizing their home. And once you've done that, when you're ready to change out your heating system, there's a lot of benefits of heat pumps. There's two different kinds of them um, and they can. there's many ways to make them work for your house. And then lastly, you can uh, use solar energy in a variety of different ways to power your heat pumps. And keep in mind that we're giving you a preview of the whole process here, but it's okay to do step by step. It's a it's a involved process and um, energy educators 
like myself and Anne are here to uh, help you work through that process. So I'll turn it over to Anne now to touch on some of the concerns that um, folks commonly have about heat pumps. Yeah, I would like to address some of the concerns, some of them that were raised by your Earth Care Committee and others that we've heard over time. Um, one of the most common things that we've heard is that heat pumps don't work in cold weather. Actually, there are cold weather heat pumps that are specifically designed for cold weather and they do, those cold, those, uh, cold climate models will heat your home um, built to below zero. Um, Maine, for example, has the highest per capita adoption of heat pumps in the country and it's working in Maine. So it'll work in upstate New York. Um, so even cold weather air source heat pumps are less efficient at lower temperatures. As Lee said, the ground source is a constant steady temperature four feet below. So no matter how cold it gets, your ground source heat pump is gonna work just fine and be very efficient. But air source heat pumps, when the air is colder outside, they become less efficient. So starting at around 20 degrees or 15 to 20 degrees, depending on the model of heat pump that you have, the efficiency starts to drop a little bit, but they will still work. They just have to work harder to, to keep your home heated. And they'll continue to work till about 19 below zero. And then they shut themselves off. <laughs> yeah. So you don't have to worry about if it's 20 or 10 or nine or seven degrees or below two degrees below zero, they will keep working for you. They're just a little bit less efficient. If you have a wood stove, that would be a good time to crank up the wood stove, um, but they will still work. So another concern is how expensive they are up front. And they are, these are expensive systems, especially geothermal is expensive up front. But what you have to understand is they're 200 to 400% more efficient than whatever you're using now. So that means that the money that you're paying out up front is gonna get reimbursed to you over the years because it's, so, it's gonna be so much cheaper, especially if you use oil or propane or coal to heat your home. Um, it's gonna, you're gonna gain that money back over time. And there, as Lee pointed out, tons of incentives, especially right now. And with the new uh, Biden IRA money coming in April, um, it's, gonna even, it's gonna even get better. So you can sort of gauge your own uh, situation and decide, is it worth plumping the money up front in order to gain it back over time? Or could I take out a loan to cover the part that's not covered by incentives? And that's the kind of calculation that you, each person, each household is gonna to have to make. And our energy advisors can help with, help with that kind of thinking. Um, natural gas is currently, as, as Lee mentioned, is currently cheaper and, and you won't save as much money. However, I need to point out to you that natural gas is going to get much more expensive because over time, as more and more people switch off of natural gas or fossil gas onto electric, there will be fewer and fewer customers using gas, but it's the same amount of infrastructure that NYSEG has to support for gas. And so there will be fewer customers supporting the same large system. And so those numbers are going up. Gas is gonna get more expensive over time. It could take two years, could take five years, but eventually, um, it's just not even, it's not gonna be worth it. So you'll decide when it makes sense to switch. Um, so how to choose a contractor is another concern that people have. It's very important that you make sure that you choose a certified, a BPI, Business Professional Institute contractor to do the work um, because you have to have a BPI certified contractor if you're gonna get the incentives. The state is requiring those contractors who, who, who work with them to get you the incentives 
they are quality controlled by the state. So they, they know that they're doing it right. And that's why they're willing to give the incentives to you. There are plenty of contractors who are not BPI certified. And so you're not likely to be able to qualify for some of the incentives if you use a non-certified contractor. Um, but there are local and regional contractors available. Um, many local, some from Buffalo, Utica, Syracuse. I mean, they're coming from all over to Tompkins because there's a lot of work here. So you won't have a, have trouble. There are lots to choose from. We can't, at Cooperative Extension, we won't uh, recommend, we don't make recommendations amongst the different contractors, but we can tell you to make sure that they're BPI certified before you hire them. Um, so there were questions and concerns about the coolant. The coolant, the refrigerant that runs the heat pump systems is dangerous. It is toxic, it is, hard, it is bad for the environment, which is another reason to be careful about your contractor because you don't want someone to set up a heat pump system for you and then the coolant leaks. Mm -hmm. if, um, because then it's going into the atmosphere and it's, it's destroying any benefit that you're getting from the heat pump. There are new coolants that are being produced, that are being researched and produced now. They're not available yet, but there are new versions coming that will not be dangerous to the atmosphere. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of business people who would love to be the first to discover what really works because they'll make a lot of money. Um, so that's happening. I don't, I can't tell you when, but there are new versions of it uh, being researched right now. Uh, so that's about the coolant. And so, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Myra. I had the question about the coolant because my heat pump's about five years old and all of a sudden it stopped working and they found a leak. Well, they didn't find the leak yet, but they found the coolant missing. So that was kind of depressing. I'm not quite sure what the coolant was. It's not Freon anymore. Um, but will when the new types of coolants emerge, will they work in the old types of heat pumps? Yes. Well, that's really cool. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes, and you should just make sure that a contractor checks your system to fix the leak, to find the leak and fix it. They can't come until the summertime. Oh, so, man. Yeah, I know, exactly. It it was, and I've heard that even a small leak like a pinhole could cause Yeah, it. yeah, it's, it's serious. You might You might try as many different contractors as you can find um, to see who can come and find that leak for you. Well, it's how so, I'll just say yeah, it's thanks, Myra. And that's who I have the contract with. Yeah. So. so another concern is, but if everything in my house is going to be electric, what if the grid goes down? And yeah, if the grid goes down, your heat pump won't work. Um, but if the grid goes down, your oil fired furnace or boiler won't work and your gas fired furnace won't work. So no heating system will work if the grid goes down. So yes, that's a concern. And we do need to put pressure on NYSEG to make sure that they are continually upgrading the grid so it can handle all this new electrification that we're sending onto the grid. Um, but it's not, good, it's not any better with a gas or an oil system if the grid goes down because the, um, the way that your system starts up, the way that initiates the heat is electric. So it won't work anyway. Um, so let me think what else. Okay, well, you will have to get used to a different system. Um, heat pumps work differently than boilers or furnaces. You're, you, we're used to turning the thermostat down at night because we don't need the house to be so warm and then turning it up in the morning. Or we're used to turning it way down if we're going to be gone for the whole weekend and then turning it up when we get back. This is the worst thing you could do for heat pumps. They do not work well when you're constantly changing the temperature through the thermostat. The What we've been told is set it and forget it. So find a temperature that's comfortable for you and just leave it because when you, um, if you were to reduce the temperature, turn the thermostat down, and then in the morning, turn it up again, it does, it does not come back very quick. And what it will do is it'll switch to resistance heating 
to get what you're asking for quickly. And then over time, be able to pull the heat pump back on to the temperature that you're asking for. The resistance heating is very inefficient and you do not want to be using it. So you, you don't want to turn it down and then turn it up and then turn it down and turn it. You want to just find a temperature that's comfortable and just leave it there. Mm -hmm. So that takes some getting used to. The other thing that I've found, and I do have heat pumps throughout my house that was hard to get used to is that the number on the thermostat, on the little handheld individual room thermostat um, doesn't correspond with how warm it actually is in the room. One thing is that the air source heat pump is way up at the ceiling. So it's measuring the temperature way up there. It's not measuring the temperature where you are sitting at your kitchen table. So it's going to, you're going to have to set it higher than you think because it's measuring the, the temperature way up there. But the other thing is that some of the contractors have told me that the number on the thermostat is just a is just a gauge for warmer, cooler, warmer, cooler. And the numbers don't actually correspond to exactly what the temperature is. So the important thing is to, to find the temperature that feels comfortable to you, no matter what the number says on the on the thermostat, and just set it and leave it there. Um, and yep. Why do they put it on the ceiling? Why not put it on the ground floor and let the heat rise? There are some versions that are that look more like radiators um, that are sitting on the floor. They do have some of those versions that's, that sit on the floor. But it didn't take me long to figure out. I mean, they have fans in them that push the heat out. And they also have vents where you can decide whether the heat is going down or even, or whether the, the vent will like continually rotate. So you can direct it, you can direct the heat and you can also um, turn the fan on higher. Those are other ways to control where the heat is going. And I haven't found it a problem. Once I found a temperature that worked, even though it was way up on the ceiling, it's been fine and I don't change it. Um, but they do have, and I'm not familiar, I haven't seen them in person, I've only seen pictures. They do have ones that look more like the old fashioned radiators that sit on the floor. So some people think that heat pumps are noisy and ugly. Um, the ugly part is outside of the house. I mean, they're not terrifically ugly, but they're just big and bulky and they sit there on the outside of your house. Um, but you don't see that inside at all. And the inside, as you saw in Lee's pictures, um, the mini splits, the air source mini splits are up near the ceiling and they're kind of sleek and they're not very big. And I don't think they're ugly. Um, if you have, if you currently have forced air heating in your home, the heat pump can work right through your existing vents, right through your existing, um, what, what you've already got. And that's not ugly. So I, I don't, I don't perceive them as ugly, but, um, and they're not noisy. The mini splits are not noisy. I can hear the fan a little bit when it goes on, but it's just a air sound. It's just a whooshing sound. It's not a grinding sound of any kind. The outdoor units do make some noise sometimes, but I can't hear them when I'm in the house. I want to mention mold. Um, as Lee mentioned, uh, heat pumps will dehumidify your house, which helps with mold. Um, but some people have said that they tightened up their home and really air sealed it seriously. And what that does is it traps moisture in the house. And if your house is too tight, you will get mold. You will get mold in the basement. You will get mold in the walls. You will get mold in the heat pump. Um, so what you have to do is pay attention to your ventilation and make sure that that air changes are happening in the house. My house is still so leaky that I don't have to worry about that, but, <laughs> but they do have systems which will retain the heat in the house, but let some air circulate out. So if you're getting mold, you need to check your ventilation. Um, so the last thing I wanna say is, 
the situation of people who are renting their home. Heat pumps are, tenants are not going to buy heat pumps. The, the person who owns the building is the person who gets the heat pumps. And convincing your landlord to do that is a path. And you might be able to do that. You might be able to help them and share this information with them and let them know that they can get some of the rebates based on their tenant's income, not based on their income. So that's an incentive for landlords to do it. There's a danger of landlords raising the rent if they upgrade uh, the apartment, they upgrade the home, whether it's air sealing and insulating and making it more comfortable or it's adding heat pumps, there is a danger of them thinking that they can that they can raise the rent. And that's a problem. And the city of Ithaca doesn't have any way to make uh, rent control happen. The state does not allow individual municipalities, except for New York City, to um, do rent control. So there's a fight going on. But anyway, it's a problem for tenants. But the audit can still happen. And then the tenant could argue with the landlord about, here's some upgrades that would make sense. So the situation for tenants is more difficult, um, but there are some things that can be done. There are some do-it-yourself, DIY, low-cost, no-cost things that can happen um, that don't need to involve the landlord. And the audit would still make sense for the landlord to do to find out how to upgrade the building. Um, so we can help tenants think about how to approach landlords and, and what the issues are. If, those listening are are um, are renting. So I think that's at least going to talk about some. Um, how do you know when to switch? Yeah, and I just want to be mindful of time. We definitely want to leave some time for questions for you all. So just letting you know, we're about to to close out here and open that up to you all. Um, just want to check on one thing that Anne had mentioned. Um, she mentioned the IRA funds coming in April. And I just wanted to clarify that we don't have an exact date. Right. When those will be coming out. We've just, just wanted to let everyone know there's no magic key about April, but that um, at some point. Um, and so when it comes to- Oh, Lee, you are freezing. Switching over your system and um, tool that you're already using and that there are more rebates coming down. I hope. Let's see. Can you all hear me all right? I just got a message. My connection was unstable. Yeah, you're freezing. Maybe if you turn off your video, your audio will improve. Won't take as much bandwidth. Let's see. Can Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay, I just shut off my camera for a moment. Um, so yes, when it comes to switching your system, the most important time to be ready to switch is when your, your current heating system is getting old and seems to be on its way out. That's when you'd really wanna engage with this um, and think about being ready to put the heat pump system in so that you're not stuck with a furnace that dies and you have to replace it with another furnace. So if your system is getting old, that's a really good time to think about um, this upgrade. But even if you have a newer system that's more efficient, it's a great time to start with an energy audit and weatherize your home and be all ready to go and have a plan for installing heat pumps. And at that point, then it really comes up to you with your financial equation on how much you're spending on energy now. Would you like to have a you know more efficient and less costly system sooner? Or perhaps you're just ready to wait a few years and be ready to uh, switch the heat pumps once your current system gets older and um, isn't as efficient. So all that is to say, it's a bit of a complicated situation, but as Anne has touched on, energy advisors are here to help. We have our website here, which I'll also put in the chat for you. Um, and we have free energy advising. This is the team of us. We cover the whole Southern tier um, and that's eight counties across the Southern tier. And we'll help you figure out which con which incentives you're eligible for and which contractors participate in those programs and help you get connected and work through that process. So um, 
we'll definitely uh, make sure to leave questions. Uh, we want to hear your questions now, and I'll put my contact information in the chat, but I uh, encourage you all to um, check out our website, learn more about these incentives, and certainly be in touch with me with questions to, uh, if you're ready to start this process. So I'll stop share now so I can see all of you, but we're ready to uh, answer some questions. Hopefully my internet will let me have my camera on. There's, there's some uh, questions that are unanswered that are still in the chat. Let's see if I can bring it up again. It just disappeared. Yeah, I can take a look at that and pull it up now. Um, yeah, there, uh, one is from, I think you answered the one from Myra. Myra, yeah. and um, so we answered the one about let, Windows. Yeah, I, let, me I, talk, I, let me talk to you, Kelly, about Windows. Um, replacing your Windows is very expensive and it doesn't gain you very much. If your window's broken, yeah, replace it. But in terms of replacing all the windows in the house and putting in brand new, it doesn't really, it doesn't get you that much. It doesn't benefit you that much. It would be better to spend the money on air sealing and insulation um, than on windows. But you can caulk them outside or inside all the way around the frame. That helps a lot. And you can... If you if you feel like the glass itself is cold, um, I see you have your curtains closed in the window behind you. That's exactly what you need to do at night. Close the curtains when the sun is out. Open the curtains, or you can get uh, kits that have plastic that you could put on the inside of the window that that help air seal it. But replacing windows is really expensive and doesn't get you that much gain. Yeah, and that's why it's a great place to start with a free energy assessment because the energy auditor you talk with can help you identify, you might feel the windows are what need to be changed out, but they might be able to help you identify some more cost-effective insulation and air sealing measures. Or they might be able to let you know, yep, you know that that window is really inefficient. There's a, a better one you can get and there's a tax credit for it. So energy assessment's a great place to start there. Uh, then I see Michael's question. We covered how um, if you have a water radiator system, then for heat pumps, you'd probably be looking at a ductless mini split if you were going with an air source heat pump system. And with a geothermal system, it's possible, um, with, depending on the how hot the temperature is in your um, hot water radiators, it's possible to um, use a geothermal system there. So um, go ahead, Anne. Looked like you had something to add. Yeah, I do. Um, I have a, a baseboard hot water system in my house with a oil fired furnace in the basement, which is now defunct. Um, but what I was told from several different places is that the temperature that the <clears throat> that the um, water needs to be is at 180 in the in the water system in the baseboard water, but the geothermal can only get it up to 120. So you need some kind of booster. That, so the, now you're back into fossil fuels again. Um, so it, they are working on, and, and actually in Europe, there, is a, there are a lot of systems that can be plugged right into the baseboard hot water. And they're working on, Tatum Engineering here locally has been working on it. And they did a pilot last year or so um, on how, how we could set up systems that would actually work with your existing uh, water system, um, but it's not commercially available yet. It might be in the future. Yeah, and so then, um, but all this is to say that's why it's a great reason they get multiple quotes from contractors, and we're giving you our best idea with the way we know these systems, but someone who comes out and looks at your house will be able to propose a few different uh, designs to you. Uh, and then I see Michael's comment about the basement height not being tall enough to fit a heat pump water heater. That's true. A heat pump water heater needs a certain clearance around it to function. So if you don't have a basement or utility room that can fit that, then a heat pump water heater might not work for your house. So that's true. It doesn't work for every for everyone, but uh, still a good option to know about and look into because there are many homes that it will work for. I think they go into crawl spaces. 
I think they can fit in crawl spaces. Yeah, well, there's a certain amount of clearance that you need around the height of it and the width. So I guess it depends on how big your crawl space is, but uh, certainly there's a variety of different ways that folks can make it work. And uh, um, one of those certified uh, contractors with uh, certifications, that's a great way to make sure you're getting a good system that'll work well for your house. And then I see Francis's question, a hydronic system. That. Does that answer it, Francis? Yeah, that, I feel like you've got your question answered. That, yeah, that answers it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Great. And then I see Linda's question about um, being in Syracuse. Uh, I'm The Southern Tier team I'm part of with Energy Advisors all throughout the Southern Tier, that's actually part of a statewide effort that NYSERDA, the state energy agency, launched. And we're called Energy Hubs. And we have Energy Advisors throughout the state. And there's a different one for Syracuse. So, um, Linda, there's an Energy Hub for your area. And I can um, pull up that link and add it into the chat um, when I get a moment. So yes, everyone throughout the state can seek energy advising and that's what's awesome. We can all be part of this effort to reach the state climate goals and we're all getting united this way. Let's and I'll, I'll answer Betsy's yeah. question. Go ahead, Anna. Um, yes, yes, neighbors can join on a geothermal system and link their homes together you could do a ground source system that would then pipe to all all the homes. Um, there There is a group of homes in Lansing on a cul-de-sac. I think there are 12 homes and they have put in a proposal to NYSEG to do exactly that. Mm. Um, I can hook you up with those people personally um, if you want to find out what how they're how it's going for them and whether they're able to do it. Is there a distance um, limit? I don't know. I don't know. That's one thing that she would be able to tell you is how far away can they be from each other before it will work. I also know that there are a couple of proposals downtown in Ithaca for multiple buildings to get on one geothermal loop. They're talking about putting a geothermal loop under DeWitt Park and hooking up the Presbyterian Church and the Baptist Church and the town, town hall and some other building all right there next to DeWitt Park, all running off the same geothermal loop. And there's another one being proposed over by Titus Towers to hook up some of those residents in, in that neighborhood. So yes, people are thinking about it and it's a great idea. So does it, you have to make a bigger geothermal loop than you would for one person? So the cost increases. Yeah, but it doesn't, it, it won't be as much as if every individual house did their own geothermal unit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll make a note um, to connect you with the, the, that Lansing woman. And you, okay, you guys you. can talk with each other. Thank you. Yeah. Great. And then going down through the list, I see, uh, so Linda had a couple other questions and I did put that link in the chat to uh, your, where you can find your regional energy hub and um, they can, the energy advisors there can help you navigate sort of the specific uh, specifics of your home heating. So going through, I see Bonnie's question, radiant heat in the house, would it be candidate for heat pumps? I'm an oil boiler, an indirect, hot water heater, and we'll have to get hot oilies. Okay, with radiant heat, it gets a little complicated. Um, and feel free to jump in here, but my hunch there is that uh, ductless mini splits, um, anyone is a candidate for those regardless of your heating system. When it comes to having um, a heat pump plug into that radiant heating system, I believe that goes into some of what Ann was mentioning with the experimental air to water heat pumps. I've talked with a few folks in our area who are interested in that technology where you heat up water that circulates through your floor and that's experimental still in the U.S. There, People are doing it more in Europe but not a lot over here. So um, with your question, Bonnie, that's uh, there's probably a way to make heat pumps work with a ductless system but um, I'd be happy to talk more with you offline and again probably the way to go is going to be getting a few quotes from different contractors. 
Let's see. Myra asked, what do you think of new generators with batteries that can be charged ahead of time? Can those run a heat pump or oil furnace? I don't know anything about generators. They're, they're, they're run by propane or gas. No, they have generators now that have batteries and you charge the battery by plugging it into the wall. So the question is, would that be a good workaround if you had a power failure and you still wanted to run your heat pump? Could you run the heat batteries pump? Batteries are a good are a good um solution for for the grid going out. Yeah. Um I guess but I don't know. No, it's I don't know about these this kind of generators, Myra. Right. It would be a whole study in generators as to whether they can store enough energy to effectively run a heat pump, depending on how much the heat pump right. requires and for how long. Right. So I don't know about them either. I just, a friend of mine has one and he's crazy about it, but he hasn't had to use it too much. Yeah. It's very cute. Know. It's like a little suitcase. We can <laughs> ask, Lee, can you make a note of that? And we can ask um, Guillermo or somebody else if they know anything about that. Yeah, Myra, I recommend actually um, sending me an email at that email I put in the chat and we could um, get some input from a colleague about that. Yeah. And I see Margaret now um, has Margaret has her hand up. So I see you might be cutting us off with our timing here. No, 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 no. I want to jump in on on um, backup generators um, that different ones are sized for different purposes. And those small battery ones are probably mostly so you can keep the thermostat to your your fossil fuel fired uh, furnace going uh, so that you can keep the lights on and your refrigerator going. Um, they, they don't, I don't know how much electricity heat pumps use. So that is an important question to research, but any backup generators would have to be sized to handle that. And um, propane is, is actually one of the better, more ecological ways to run a backup generator. It's much, so much better than diesel and um, it's less impactful for the environment than natural gas. Propane is a byproduct of the production of natural gas. So it's not a long-term solution, but as an intermediate solution, it's fine. And batteries themselves have their own impact. So I, I think a propane generator is a good idea and usually the companies installing them do, they say, what do you want to have on the circuit that the generator is plugged into? So um, as the weather gets more extreme, that matters more and more. Uh, but I'm going to be very anxious to find out what kinds of backup generators people need to fire um, heat pumps for which size dwelling. Oh, and while I have you, as a renter, one of the things, selling points to landlords for installing heat pumps for heating and cooling is that a lot of buildings have natural gas for heating um, hot water for the entire building. And yet they have tenants with windows open in the winter and all kinds of stuff. If they put in heat pumps, the bill for heating goes to the tenant's electric bill. And so uh, the CLCPA has protection, so landlords can't raise the rent on people when they do it, but it means renters will pay more attention to their heat because they'll start paying it. So that's an incentive to landlords to install heat pumps. So um, I'm gonna answer Francis's question. <coughs> I have a five bedroom, two-story, five-bedroom house. It's big. It's way too big for me. But when we first lived here, we had seven adults and, and a child. Um, <laughs> so I have, uh, I do not have a heat, an air source mini split in every room, not even in every bedroom. But I have five total. And that is sufficient to heat. I have two bedrooms upstairs and I have the kitchen and two other rooms downstairs and that's enough. It's heat so, so I know people who have smaller homes who just have one. 
mini mm -hmm. split and it heats the whole home. But your auditor will tell you how much you might need. So when you have the audit, that's a question like, okay, what do you think? How many do I need? And where, where could I put them? Because we had to have long discussions about where do I spend most of my time? Where does the air flow? If I put the heat pump here, will the air flow out to there? So it's a whole discussion, but your auditor will, will be able to talk with you about that. Yeah. And just to jump on there. And um, so one thing you'll want to know is not every auditor is a heat pump installer. Some are just energy auditors. Some are just insulators. Some may be a company that also installs furnaces. And so um, that's why it's good to get familiar with the contractors through the resources on our website or getting in touch with me if you're not sure um, what one of them does or, of course, calling them directly. Um, but when you are having, a, if you have an energy auditor who can also assess you for heat pumps, that's great. Or you can do the energy audit first and then get a heat pump quote. And the person there can do it. It's called a heat load analysis. And they basically add up how many um, units of heat is needed to keep your house comfortable. And again, that can be reduced by weatherizing the house and you want to get it to as low a level as it can be. But then they'll size up the heating load of your house and propose a system that would meet that. And there may be a few different arrangements of how the heads could work and the heat pump heads. And that's why getting multiple quotes are good. Betsy? Do you recommend, it sounds like it might be a good idea to have an auditor who is not your contractor and look at the, do a, a thorough audit uh, based on, you know, a special expertise as an auditor and then come to you and see, you know, what's best to insulate what you have money for and then get a look at a contractor. Uh, I mean, I I looked at, I had a contractor come by and I don't think he did a very thorough audit. Uh, so yeah, it's- I think you're probably right. There are some who don't. So who who to call for the audit, NYSEG? Who do you call, call me? For, for the energy audit, you can check yeah. in with me depending on the income level where you are. Um, uh -huh. If you're in the low and moderate income level, you'll want to pick a contractor who's within that Empower Plus program. And if you're above that level, there's another um, set of contractors. There's some overlap between the two sets, but basically you'll want to identify if you'll be eligible for that state grant. There's a pool of contractors that you'd choose. And if not, there's another pool. So I thought NYSEG offered the free audits. You know, I've heard people talking about that historically. They remember NYSEG coming to their house and giving audits. Right now, there it isn't a NYSEG audit program that I'm aware of. So yeah, there, there was I years ago, there was. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So, Kelly, the pros and cons of ducts. The ducts are for the geothermal and the wall units are for the air source. So they're two different systems. Um, the... The mini splits are their own separate unit. They don't use your existing ducts, but you might be able to use existing ducts if you do the geothermal. The, is the geothermal what you were talking about going underground? Yes. But I have, I, I have an air exchange that uses the ducts. Yeah, I was, I was yeah. going to mention, and an air source heat pump actually can go into your ducted okay. system as well. Yeah, there's two different kinds of it's air source. It's a different heat one. Pumps. It's not the mini splits. Right, it's exactly. Like it's a whole house system. Yep, yep. So there are air source heat pumps that go with your duct work. And there's also air source heat pumps that are just mini splits on the wall. Yeah. Um, and the pros and cons of that, um, my, to my knowledge, uh, it really depends on, you know, there might be cost savings. If you already have ducts in the house and they can just install the system right in there, that might save you money. Generally, with the air flowing through the ducts, it may lose a little bit of efficiency of heat because um, it's just a, a wide um, radius that's running through and then you need to make sure your ducts are properly sealed. So from what I've heard, the ducts may, um, you know, lose a little bit of, of heat along the way, but basically both types of systems are very common and uh, can work well in people's different houses. So I, again, I would have a heat pump contractor look at your house, determine what the heat load is of the house and propose uh, some different systems for you. Uh, 
Now, I see Bonnie's question about the wired in generator. Again, so we don't have knowledge at this point about generators. Um, folks have specific questions. Um, you can get in touch with me by email after. Again, generators are a little out of our wheelhouse, but um, but we can maybe connect you with someone who, who could better uh, talk with you. And just want to jump on there too when we we're thinking about generators and emphasize that from uh, other colleagues I've talked with and, and knowledge of this field, um, as Ann mentioned, even though you're switching to heat pumps and you might think I really want a form of backup heat, um, your current furnace or boiler probably doesn't work when the power goes out either because the fan isn't working on it. So a really great way to be ready for power outages, regardless of your heating system, is insulating and weatherizing your house. And that way, say the, the power isn't usually out for more than a few hours. And so that'll keep the heat in very well. So just want to uh, kind of Ease, ease that worry there. Generators might still make sense for you, but certainly not a requirement for, um, for a heat pump system. Uh, I do see a question by someone on the phone. Uh, yeah, if it's 316-0398 number, that would be me. So <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I was educated as a mechanical engineer and I've just recently bought a 1700 square foot house that has a geothermal heat pump. It's an open loop system, so it takes fresh water out of what had been a former drinking water well, but now we have town water supplied. And um, it tied into a forced air system that had been served by a natural gas furnace. It, uses 10 kilowatts of energy at 220 to 240 volts. It uses nine kilowatts or so for cooling, which is a little more efficient. The um, coefficient of performances that were discussed previously um, it's if you've got a coefficient of performance of three, say, then three times the electricity that the compressor and fans take up is what you'll see for a heating effect or a cooling effect. So it is quite efficient. And let's see. So yeah, 1700 square foot. We've got four inch walls only. So R11 insulation in the walls and maybe six inches of fiberglass on the ceiling. At this point, we're still waiting for our energy audit. And we have a backup generator that's 1800 kilowatts. So it's enough, or 18 kilowatts rather. So it's enough to supply the heat pump plus all the other utilities in the house. Not that I added any of this stuff. We just bought the house as is. Sound like you're in good shape. Yeah, I think so. Um, we're we're lowering ceilings, adding insulation. We've had an energy audit done. And um, so we're proceeding on some considerable conservation measures, among which was taking out the chimney unused after the natural gas fired furnace was no longer used. And um, the energy auditor certainly pointed out that any of these ceiling penetrations allow a lot of heat to escape and, and set up a, an evacuation heat from the basement and water vapor. Thanks for Thank your you. example. And yeah, thanks for sharing that. And on that note, I saw in the chat that Barbara also shared um, their experience and sound they sound very happy with the, the geothermal heat pump system. So sounds like there's some great community members to learn from here. And, and remember, ask folks you know about their systems and learn from them through this process. Um, Kelly, I'm looking at your question about the Airbnb. Why don't you email uh, Lee or I because this sounds like it's going to be a conversation. Yep. Yep. My email's in the chat. So Kelly, feel free to get in touch with me there. Happy to talk with yeah. you. 
And we um, answered the Syracuse. We answered, um, and then I see Rachel had a question about Seneca County from the Smart Energy Hub, not as informative as this talk. Well, well, they'll get there. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, all the hubs are in different phases of getting set up, but you'd like to explore contractors in Tompkins County because we're only two miles north of Trumansburg. Yeah, why don't you get in touch with you, Rachel, and we can have a, a chat there and figure out, might be some working together with the other hub and helping you get set up there. So please do send me an email. Um, thanks. Jerry was, yeah, you're welcome. Jerry's just adding the note that um, when I say did audits, they didn't do the blower door test. So I guess there's some uh, historical learning there. So blower door tests are included from NYSERDA, um, definitely for the low income folks. For the higher income folks, a blower door test is not a required measure, which means that you may have to pay a fee for it and you may have to ask your contractors. That's just some insider scoop. Um, the blower door test definitely free now if you're low and moderate income and might be a fee for it um, if you're higher income, but it's a very useful tool. And then, so go just, ahead, Anne. I just wanted to ask Jerry if you have anything you wanna add. Oh, you've done such a good job. <laughs> That's what I, uh, um, I don't think, uh, I might come back with some comments to you of just, just some questions that I had. Okay. Um, one is that um, my concern that I think the uh, R410A uh, refrigerant in the currently leaking uh, uh, air source heat pump system, when the new refrigerants come out, I do I I do think it still needs to be replaced with R410A. Unfortunately, I think you have to keep the refrigerant the same. Uh, but frankly, as long as it's intact and 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 someone can uh, keep it from leaking again, that's where you want it. You know, you need to find a contractor who will make sure that it will not leak. That's that's the bottom line. Because even this next generation of refrigerants are not. Um, it's not solidly where we're, where, where we're headed. There's one we're going yeah. to get after that that is. Um, but but the main thing is uh, make sure um, they're not just adding, make sure they're not just adding more refrigerant to replace, but actually yeah. correcting the problem. That, that's yeah. all I have to say. Great. Thank you, I'll Jerry. try to get more yeah. information on that. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what they did. They added a lot of oh. refrigerant and it's it still didn't work and that's why they said they have to come back in the summer and the cost Ugh. of the refrigerant was like a thousand dollars but because i had a contract with them they i didn't have to pay but it's scary sounding you know with all that yeah it's very scary yeah yeah if you I'm don't sorry, get it resolved right. myra get in touch with us yeah yeah we're certainly happy to assist so um Feel Thank free to, to reach out, Myra, if you're having trouble getting yeah. that fixed. Yeah. So Jim, I think we've answered yeah. all the questions and it's uh, 20 oh, minutes after thing. your date. Uh, can I just interrupt you? I think this yeah. lady, Marion, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I want I wanted some clarification about uh, using um, mini splits or the radiator type floor unit with ground source. Is it? Uh, I've been told that that's workable, but is is that right? The mini splits are air source. Are they only air source? You can't use them with ground source, with geothermal. If you're using yeah. geothermal, it's going to come through ducts, I think. Yeah, I can't um, do ducts in my house. Mainly, or it, or it, when we figure out how to heat water then it could come through the radiators. Um, but le as Lee said, it's, it's very common in Europe, but it's not really happening here yet. Um, although Tatum has been involved in some of that work. Uh, so it, it, the ground source will typically come through your the vents that are on your floor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Although um, it it is possible if you have a... Um, uh, 
but yeah, the air to water, um, having an air source heat pump system that heats up water is, is the experimental part of it. With a geothermal system, um, there, there's a few different ways the system can work. Um, this is getting a little out of the like technical expertise that I have, which is why I recommend folks talk with contractors about this. But um, Marion, the, the best thing you can do is get a, a few different quotes for your house because there may be a variety of different ways to make the systems work. There's a few creative things. Um, VRFs, variable refrigerant flows. There's a few different technologies uh, that when it comes to making a heat pump fit in for your house. So um, I don't have a clear cut answer to your question either way, but that's definitely something that getting multiple quotes can help you with. And um, yeah, and you can always try a Sierra Cooperative Extension. And if we don't know the answer, we can try to find a good resource for you. We'll find it, yeah. Go okay. ahead, um, Margaret. Looks like you wanted yeah, to talk. I just want to check and see if Jim's hand is still up or from before or if he has something else to add. And then I ha do have a general comment question. It's one you may not want to address, but it's kind of the sub question I hear behind many of these questions. So first, I just want to check in with Jim. Um, did you have something new to, to add or ask, Jim? Can you hear me, Margaret? I can hear you. Yeah, your hand is still up. So that, that's a toggle. So if, if you don't mean for it to be, you can just hit star nine again. Yeah, I'll have to hit star nine again. Okay, thanks. thanks. Okay, now the general question I have that is in the background behind all these other questions is how do you know that a contractor is the right contractor? They might be big, they might be small, they might be BPI certified or not. Um, and so uh, is that something where you all can help people say, well, this company has a pretty good reputation or that, no, so no, we're, so that's why you recommend multiple contractors and then we have to judge whether we think that person's appropriate or not. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes the pool gets narrowed down if you, once you kind of figure out all the different programs you can use. Sometimes it gets to the point where there's only maybe a couple contractors who are, say you live in Lansing, you're using these special Lansing incentives and your income qualified um, and you want heat pumps. That kind of narrows it down to there's only a few left. So it's not like you're choosing from hundreds. Once you figure out which programs you can use, that narrows it down a bit. And then we can certainly help you understand like the size of each of the contractors and talk with you about, you know, the, what are the different characteristics, like the service level versus, you know, big company, small company, responsiveness, things like that. It's just, it's not our place as a, you know, provider of community information to be um, jacking up the business of one contractor versus another. And um, also, frankly, if we, you know, picked our favorite and sent you there, then like, um, that would not be supporting the growth of the business in the area. So there's a few different reasons. Um, uh, it's not to say that in the future we won't have a process of, you know, fairly uh, having a way for all these contractors to apply and be in partnership with us. But right now, um, the right thing for us to do is just talk with you. We can give you as many details as we know about all the contractors and help you go from there about, you know, picking one of them. But it's just we're not in a place to tell you, you know, this guy is my favorite. This one's the best one for you. So just when it's not really in our scope, but we're here to, to help you kind of with as much information as we have. And then you can and, make the decision. And you there. could get more than one quote. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah that, that's more than one contractor. Yeah. 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 I've actually you heard... can ask your friends and neighbors yeah. and put it out on a listserv. Hey, yeah. I'm thinking about this. Yeah. business has anybody got any experience i mean that's not always reliable <laughs> but um but we can't recommend yeah yeah well i i think a consumer guide to how to choose a contractor might be useful uh the other thing i've heard from people is that for their particular situation there often ends up being only one contractor even available to consider having the work done so hopefully 
as more of these incentives come out and time passes, the options will get better. And I was actually on a call with Project Drawdown yesterday with a building science engineer and what she recommended around heat pumps. Because of all the issues people raised tonight is if it's time to replace your heating system, it's a good time to switch to heat pumps. If you don't need to do it just now, be planning, be researching, be ready to switch. Um, the better refrigerants are in the pipeline. And also, uh, Annerly, one of you referred to uh, the they're phasing out the worst ones. The next one coming in is better, but they're even better ones down the line. However, uh, if it is time for you to put in a heat pump, all the ones in current systems and the next generations of systems, those refrigerants will be available for the life the expected life of your heat pump. And um, it's only far in the future that uh, its new systems will be required to use new refrigerants. Right. Old systems will not. So I think that addresses any concerns you have right. there. So um, thank you all for having so much interest in this very important topic as we work our way through this transition. And I think Anne's talking about what it's like to live with heat pumps and the adjustments you have to make. That's after you get it. And, and thank you all for having so much in, interest in the nitty gritty to help people get to heat pumps. I, yep. I just want to ask one last question. And that is, is there any time or place you would you wouldn't rec recommend a heat pump after you've gotten your energy audit. I mean, when is the situation where a heat pump doesn't work? If your heating system is really efficient and fairly new, you wouldn't qualify. I mean, if it's newer than five years, for example, you wouldn't qualify for some of the incentives. Mm-hmm. They won't replace. They won't replace it if it's that new. If it's really efficient and it's fairly new, you've sunk a lot of money into it already, and so it's important to have a plan, be ready, do your audit and upgrade. But you don't need to jump on it if the system you've got is fairly efficient. I would also say that with lots of funky old houses we have around here, I have heard of folks where you know a very old house or kind of cobbled together additions and such where it's just tough to get it to an insulation level that heat pumps can can um, can serve without putting in a big heat pump system that's expensive. So that's a hold up I've seen people have, but um, you know, ideally technology keeps advancing, incentives will keep getting better. So, um, you know, hopefully all those problems can be solved, but yeah, those are some reasons why you might um, choose not to go forward with it. Thank you so much. Are we finished, you think? <laughs> I think we are. I really appreciate you all coming. It was great to be able to share this much information with a group of people. I'm, I'm really glad we had the opportunity. Thank yes, you. I, I really appreciated talking with you all. Thank you for having us. And as I said, my information is in the chat. Um, and I'll also have uh, Betsy and Margaret send out the slides and I encourage you to get in touch with me. And if you have neighbors, friends who you think could take advantage of this, particularly um, to spread the word that even if you have lower moderate income, there are great incentives to help you out. Um, that's our that's our aim here to help make energy efficiency more affordable and accessible for everyone, so. So if there's anyone who wants the slides uh, or the, the links from the chat and you have reason to wonder whether or not I have your email, I, I won't close the meeting. I'll keep the meeting going for a few minutes so you can post your email in the chat. I've already received one request, uh, but if anybody else wants to make sure they can um, get the slides afterwards, um, just put the request in the chat. And again, thank you all for this coming. This was great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.